Several years ago, our grandson, Will, made his first visit to the beach. He was three years old. He took his hand and walked out into the surf. And the water sloshed around his ankles and eventually up to his knees. I could tell he was nervous. He was holding my hand, but he didn't say anything. But his head was going to the left, to the right, back and forth. And finally, he tugged on me. And he looked up and he said two words. He said, big water. <laughs> Given the fact that Will was three years old, and his vocabulary and the experiences of his life, I think he did a great job of expressing his vision of the Atlantic Ocean. Tonight we have an opportunity to express our vision about another very important waterway in our community, namely the Cape Fear River. And while we might not be as cogent as Will to be able to do it in two words, I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation tonight. Good evening again, my name is Tom Conway, and I'm a member, a board member of the Cape Fear Economic Development Council, which is the group that is putting forth tonight's community conversation entitled Riverfront Visioning. I see a, a number of a new faces in the crowd this, this evening. How many of you, this is the first time you've ever come to a CFEDC uh, event? Well, thank you. On behalf of the board, we're really glad that you're here. Hope that this uh, next hour or so is worthwhile and you should come back. Our website for the council is cfedc.org. And you can go there and check out the other events that we have scheduled for 2012. <clears throat> but tonight we have a, an exciting group of presenters and moderators. Before I introduce them to you, just let me tell you a little bit more about CFEDC. Our mission is to promote sustainable economic growth, job creation, and job retention in southeastern North Carolina. <clears throat> Mark King is our new chair. And Mark and the rest of the board will be here after our presentation. We'd be happy to engage you and answer any questions you might have about CFEDC. We have a few um, housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, our host, Cleve Callison from WHQR, has noted to me, and he apologizes, that the air conditioning system <coughs> went down a little bit uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, repairman has been in here, so things are, are going to improve but it might be a little bit sticky for the first few minutes. But we understand, and we say thank uh, Cleve for that improvement. Other housekeeping items, uh, especially for the new folks. The, the restrooms are down this hallway uh, to my left. We also have refreshments in the back. And there are some maps and some <coughs> articles scattered around the gallery that you might like to, to see at your convenience. We're very informal here, so during the presentation, <coughs> You want to get another soft drink or a beer, just go ahead and get up and, and, and come back to your seat. We are going to, uh, of course, have questions and answers, but I ask you to hold those until our panelists are finished, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And lastly, just so everyone knows, this is being videotaped and will appear on the CFEDC website. So those are the, the housekeeping details. Let me introduce to you now our presenters for this evening. On my extreme left is our moderator and presenter, Brent Lane. Brent comes to us from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he is the director of the UNC Center for Competitive Economies. He's an authority on the, what are called, gazelle firms, those that increase and make for a vital economy, and he is currently serving as a consultant to the battleship North Carolina. Next to Brent is Donna Ray Mitchell. Donna Ray is a landscape architect and manager of the Wilmington office of Coal, Jeunesse, and Stone, who currently, uh, which currently is serving at the Riverfront Project, uh, Riverfront Park Project here in Wilmington. Earlier in her career, Donna Ray served as a member of the Vision 2020 Committee, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. She also has served as a consultant to Bald Head Island and to the Auto Hall development. Next to Donna Ray is Phil Preet. Um, many of you again might know Mr. Preet. 
who is a senior environmental engi uh, engineer for the city of Wilmington. However, tonight, Phil is representing the Eagles Island Coalition. Phil has over 30 years' experience in environmental consulting, planning work, both in the Carolinas and in Texas. Next to Phil is Reed Mertensen. Reed is an investor and wealth manager here in the city and has a distinguished career in terms of service for various nonprofit organizations such as Habitat for Humanity and, yes, WHQR Public Radio. He's, he and his wife reside in downtown Wilmington. And lastly, attorney Steve Coggins, to my immediate left, has 34 years of, of legal experience and is a partner with the law firm of Roundtree, Losey, and Baldwin. Steve specializes in coastal legal issues and has served as the town attorney for two of our beach communities. So that's our panel. Brett, all up to you. Take it away. How many of you are still waiting for the economic recovery? <laughs> this is the economic recovery. We have recovered. I did a lot with state legislatures, county governments, and city governments, and there's a tremendous tendency to defer action until things get better. Well, for the last four years, I've been preaching that things aren't going to get better. Certainly not by themselves. We are in the recovery. This is the economy we have to make work. Now, that means we've got to not only do more with what we have, we have to create more wealth with what we have. Uh, gazelles was mentioned as one of my areas of emphasis. I used to be a venture capitalist. Um, I focused a lot on the role of innovation as a form of creating new wealth. And within our economy, in the U.S. economy, and within the North Carolina economy, within the Wilmington area economy, we have got to create more wealth because what we've been focused on for the last decade or two was really a transaction and service economy that took the limited amount of money we had and spun it around faster and faster and faster and even consolidated in fewer hands rather than more hands. We've got to create more wealth and wealth is going to come from innovation, it's going to come from entrepreneurship, not just startups, but it's going to come from mature companies that find opportunities to grow. So when we start talking about economic development now, we have to say it's what will work in the economy we have today, not the economy we hope will happen to us in the future. We need to focus on the job creation in our economy and the wealth creation in our economy, and that comes generally from a fairly small set of businesses, 1 to 3 percent in anyone's economy, that are turned gazelles. These are companies that start small and grow to become big. There are only three types of companies in any economy. Small businesses, which tend to offset up each other in terms of births and deaths. Large companies who are generally looking to maximize profit by the cutting labor. And then there are the companies that go from being small to big. Those are the gazelle companies, and the good news is they occur in every geography, they occur in every industry sector, they occur in every area of business activity. But they have not been a focus of much public policy or economic development or business finance efforts in the past. So, in general, my emphasis at the Center for Competitive Economies is how can your economy, anyone's economy, identify where the growth creators are in your economy and support that particular type of activity? So when we talk about economic development, it's just this is funny. I walked into this meeting, and it's a lot like, you ever been to your, somebody else's Thanksgiving dinner, and they pull you aside before you go in there and say, oh, be real careful, don't talk about this, because, you know, the grandma really hates, and don't talk about this. Basically, there are so many things I'm not supposed to talk about with you folks that I might as well just sit down right now. <laughs> but I do want to talk about when you talk about economic development, community development, however you characterize those terms of this community, you've got to ask yourself, is this going to grow the pie? Not is this simply going to circulate money or are we going to grow wealth because we are tapped out in terms of capital as a nation, as a community. We have to make do with what we have by making better investments with our limited resources, whether you're private individual, government, however the decisions are being made. So how are we going to grow this economy? Now, I happen to be in Wilmington this time around. I've been down here as a venture capital investors. We, one time, we're taking teams of entrepreneurs from here in Silicon Valley, showing off some of the great entrepreneurs that were coming out of this area. Unfortunately, that was about 15 years ago. This area has tremendous resources, and in most cases, from my outside perspective, you're not getting a lot out of it. Now, one resource that I happen to be down here in the last few months working with is uh, we were asked by the USS North Carolina 
asked me, and they, they came to the business school, at the Key to Fly Business School at UNC, I said, can we help them do an analysis of the economic role they have in this community? So some of you I met through that process. I met Tom through that process, and I met Lloyd and the other folks. And, and we had teams of students, MBA students, primarily economic students in the doctoral program. We were down here looking at the role of the Battleship North Carolina in the larger economy. There are four basic ways that, that it has a role in here. One is it's quite a successful business operation all by itself. In case you don't know, because when we did our survey, basically nobody did know. Battleship North Carolina is 100% privately supported. In other words, they make money. They don't get any state money. So just to clarify that, they have a significant impact just by virtue of their, their, uh, their operations, a substantial <coughs> footprint in the, in the economy of the area. Secondly, they also bring in a lot of external visitors and make an economic contribution to that Third is they actually contribute in some interesting ways to real estate values in the immediate area of the battleship. And four, they also are a significant part of this community's brand. And I'll give you just a summary of what we're going to be reporting at the end of the month. Battleship with our clients, so I can't give the full report right now. But what this, why I'm focused on this is, is that in addition to doing economic competitiveness, we look at what makes a community distinctive. And what typically will make a community distinctive is its heritage, is its history. And I do a lot of work in North Carolina, particularly Eastern North Carolina. Most of East North Carolina doesn't have the resources you have. They have history, but very little else. But history is the way we make a community special. Capitalizing on your history is an important part of the Wilmington brand. And an area that's viewed as having a distinct character is an area that people want to come to. The businesses want to locate him. The businesses want to expand it. So certainly in our work with the battleship, we've worked with a lot of the other heritage uh, sectors within the, in the Wilmington area. And we see the very important role that heritage can have in helping make a distinctive brand for Wilmington. So that's the project that we're doing with the Battleship, not actually consulting with them, although we got a little bit of donor support to do some of the, the intangible and the direct costs associated with the students. But I will tell you that working at the business school, and as a citizen and a native of North Carolina, the opportunity to work for the Battleship North Carolina, we jumped on that. Nothing I like better than having my UNC students stand in front of those big guns eating their pictures there. Because that's a role for our universities to serve the rest of the state. Now my role here today is to moderate a discussion now, I do this a lot, uh, not necessarily well, but I do it frequently. Usually my role is as an intermediary between the economist and the public. I think I'm often an interpreter of the economy for the general public, although these days I feel a whole lot more like a hostage negotiator. <laughs> Most of the economic news is simply not pleasant for people don't want to hear. But the reality is, this is the economy in which we have to make things work. And we're going to have to do that by getting more return on what we invest and what we spend, whether it's public, whether it's private. So the emphasis needs to be when you make decisions, when you're considering, and I know there are a lot of things on the, on, the, on the agenda in this community, you have to ask yourself, is this going to grow our economy? Not is it going to shift money from one unit to the other, but is it going to create new wealth within this community? That's what I want you to, that's sort of the rubric I'd like for you to, to, to use as your basis of your analysis. Now, one of the things in the history of North Carolina, poor North Carolina, poor North Carolina, we never had most of the natural resources other states have had. We don't have mineral wealth, we don't have oil wealth, we don't have a, we have historically not had deep water harbors. So in the history of this state, we've had to emphasize the role of our river system. And most of the investment that was taking place in the state in economic development in the early days was an emphasis on developing the, the river system. Developing the Cape Fear was a major area of emphasis, building the lock system, making it navigable as far as But in the last hundred years, we've really turned our backs on our rivers. But one of the areas that we focus on in communities in East North Carolina is how do they go back to capitalizing on the economic value of their rivers, whether it's the Roanoke, whether it's the Quinlan's River, that's where my dad's from, so I think it's the Quinlan's River whether it's the Cape Fear River. So some of the opportunities you have today are very much riverfront, but they're also the river itself. So I think that's, a, a, that's what we're looking forward to hearing from the panelists today. And the opportunities that the river, the Cape Fear River, the riverfront development can create new wealth within this community because it is a tremendous resource for you. Donna? Um, Donna Ray Hedgehog, I'm a landscape architect. Um, 
this plan was a long time coming. There were a lot of people promoting a vision for the waterfront um, between Market Street and the Hilton. And one of the, um, the components behind that is the Vision 2020 plan, which I, I brought a copy. It's um, several years old now. But, um, one of the precepts of the plan is that there should be no riverfront parking lots, and I'm sure you all agree with that. And uh, we have this beautiful stretch of river that, you know, should be public access. And it's, it's been an untapped opportunity, and of course, you know, we don't have the money to do it, and we don't, um, we kind of need some leadership to push it forward, but you know, to get a vision on paper was extremely important. And when this uh, HUD grant came along that uh, could fund the actual design of this master plan, I'm so proud that the city jumped on it and took the opportunity to produce this. Now, it's, it's more than a pretty picture because you all know how important parks are to a city. Uh, I think urban, it was a uh, Frederick Law Homestead, the most famous landscape architect, who said that parks are the lungs of a city. And I think you'd agree that's true, but also think about what a park does for a city economically. Think about the property values around uh, Central Park in New York or Millennium Park in Chicago. They're probably the highest priced real estate in the world. And, uh, Creating a park is a vision for a city that does create economic development. Uh, this is the presentation we did to City Council, for City Council on April 3rd. Um, this is the team. Brian Janess is our uh, design principal from Charlotte. And uh, I also want to say we did this in conjunction with um, Howerson Design Associates out of Boston. They're a premier design. Our, uh, landscape architectural group. They're, they've been famous for many award-winning waterfront park projects. And Mark, right here in our front row, is with Kaiser Trout McKenna, and he's the engineer for the project. And together, we created a vision. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about, let's see, the pieces of the park. We've got the existing riverfront park right here. And then we've got the Coast Guard piece that we're calling Phase 2. And then we've got the South Hilton parking lot that we call, call Phase 3. Now, of course, the city does not have ownership of these pieces, um, but we thought it was important to go ahead and have a vision for this so that we could get some momentum and excitement behind the plan in order to move it forward. This is a park we did in uh, Beaufort, South Carolina that's about the same size, very popular. I don't know if any of you have been there, but um, this is kind of the same uh, dream that we have for our riverfront. We had several public input meetings. Um, we had a very good turnout. We had a lot of interesting discussion, uh, everything. Uh, from you know what's expected, trees and grass, all the way to someone wanted a zip line from the USS North Carolina across. <laughs> <laughs> I only asked that one time, but it was possible. Where <laughs> they can be done in only one direction. That's right. <laughs> and these are some of the issues that came out in the public meetings. And uh, one thing our esteemed moderator talked about was capturing the character of the city, and that was important. You know, the old uh, South flavor, um, nautical, you know, uh, capturing the nautical port flavor, uh, you know, all of these things I think we've uh, pretty much attacked. And I know you can't see this very well, but I'll go to each different phase uh, so you can see it a little more in depth. But um, this is the overall master plan. Oops, sorry. Um, starting with the uh, existing area here. And this is a, a um, more of a play area for children here. And then this is an event lawn down here by the hill. So I'll go through those uh, real quickly for you. Um, the HUD grant allowed us to do the master plan and allowed us to provide 
for um, construction of one element in the existing park area. And I'll show you what that is. We're doing construction documents for that now. And i um, pretty excited about renovating just a little tiny portion of that first phase of park. Um, so what we did here, uh, you know, we have that elevated deck that's kind of a bottleneck along the river walk. We'd like to do away with that. I think the original intent was that it was a viewing platform, but it interrupts the park pretty significantly, so we'd like to take that out and provide some um, pergolas, of course, a lot more shade. We'd like to see Water Street be raised so that there's no curbing. Um, you can handle that with bollard edging, but that way, at least when we close it off for an event, farmer's market, that it's one large plaza rather than, you know, a tripper or um, being interrupted by curbing. This is the phase two. This is in front of the Coast Guard uh, Morn, and we preserve the key for them. And they do have access. Um, they can drive. This is an interactive water feature that when you turn it off, you can drive over it, access the boat, and then you can drive off because they do need truck access for deliveries. Um, we also have a children's playground here, uh, shaded pergola seating, uh, more trees along the water street, and this is a, a kiosk, a cafe, it could be a coffee shop, it could be um, any number of things, but most importantly it could be restrooms, <laughs> which was a high demand on the input list. And this, lastly, is the biggest chunk of the uh, park, and this is the event lawn. As you know, we have the downtown Wilmington concerts every Friday night, which are extremely popular. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to sit on a lawn and watch the band and uh, look out at the river um, from a green space? We've also incorporated um, some smaller kiosks along the walkway that surrounds it that could be for vendors. Um, and we've preserved um, some access for the Hilton Hotel so that they could use their drop-off for the restaurant and uh, the ramp that comes down from their uh, lobby area could still be in use. And then at each intersection, we've got an enhanced area that would be um, done with decorative brick and more trees and definitely more pedestrian friendly. Okay, this is our beautiful fountain area right here. <laughs> um, with the grant money, we have $195,000 left, and you can imagine that doesn't go very far, but our intent with that is to green up this fountain area and get the fountain working again. And this is the plan of that space with a renovated fountain, and what we're going to do is create raised planters uh, made of granite and then tree and plant those up with flowers and um, we're going to repair, take out those old trees. Um, there's some root damage um, asphalt paving that we will repair and replace. Um, we've got some benches along the back of the planters that look out over the river and that's about all for our $195,000. We'd love to do more like the like to replace those bollards and chains with this um, with a river uh, walk handrail, but um, that's going to have to be another done. And there's a rendering of it. Um, we're envisioning kind of an urn um, buckling fountain in the middle of that space, surrounded by plants. That way, people don't touch or get in the fountain. We we keep it a little bit more pristine than an interactive fountain per se that we would be doing further on um, at the foot of Princess Street. Um, the next steps, we have to finish these construction documents. We need to create a strategy for land acquisition. And um, Asheville, when they built their uh, Pack Square Park, they formed a nonprofit called uh, the Pack Square Conservancy. And it took them 10 years to raise um, $16 million, but they did it. And uh, it was a private effort. There were some naming rights that were um, sold. But um, that's uh, our idea for getting this going. And we would like to keep the momentum going. We've um, kind of been eclipsed um, with this master plan by a couple of other 
big wonderful projects in town like the baseball stadium or the Whole Foods uh, market. <laughs> um, so if you uh, have a group that would like to see this presentation, I'd be glad to do it for them. Um, just to get the word out there that we do have a vision for our riverfront park and uh, it may take us a while and take us a lot of money, but uh, wouldn't it be a great dream for our city? And I'll end with, with the uh, master plan. All right. How's this going to help businesses in downtown make more money? Oh, the property values are going to skyrocket around the park. <laughs> well, it's already skyrocketed once. You know what happens to skyrocket? <laughs> But, but, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I, I try to be real, uh, but is there expected to be a, a, a tangible and causal uh, effect in terms of local revenues, the shop owners, the restaurateurs, the, the, is that built in as a metric in assessing the success of the department? Oh, well, it's pure speculation at this point, so no metrics yet, but, uh, you know, history has it that property values do rise around the park, and um, we're trusting that that will happen here. It's always perplexed me. The, the, the rivers have historically been the loading docks of communities, but it's, they're also the center of commerce. And then so many of our cities in North Carolina, I'm sure it's typical elsewhere, some of the Buford communities that you worked in, well, that became the backyard, that became the sanitation, the warehouse. And now you have the opportunity to make it more of a front yard, make it the, the commerce interface as well. And certainly Wilmington's got more assets there uh, than most other communities in the state. Is, that, is it fair to characterize this as an effort to transform the riverfront from a back door to a front door? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think the survey that was done by the city and the parks bond that supported more parks in Wilmington um, talked a lot about, you know, we need a good downtown park. We don't really have one. In fact, New Hanover County has the lowest uh, number of parks per capita in the whole state. So uh, we're definitely under park, and uh, that's a word. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we see this as the crown jewel of the city, and uh, what a spectacular place it would be to draw tourists and businesses alike. Now, as moderator, I get to ask questions when they finish, and y'all have to wait until after everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Unless Tom tells me otherwise. Phil, what's happening on the other side of the river? <clears throat> well, I'm about to tell you. Okay. Good to be here this evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, I am Phil Freak, as um, Tom said, and I am the environmental planner, not the engineer. I'll correct Tom on that. And there is a big difference. I know there's at least one planner in here, so I won't say it's an insult, but it's definitely wrong. Uh, anyway, I am not wearing that hat tonight, though. No, I am uh, wearing the hat of the Eagles Island Coalition. I'm the chair of the Eagles Island Coalition. And just for grins, I know a lot of you in here, but is there anybody here that does not know where Eagles Island is? Anybody at all? Not totally. Well, that's why I got the dump stool over here. <laughs> um, I was hoping you might explain what it was. I, I'm going to. He, he's been working for one of the tenants on Eagles Island, and, and that's the battleship, so I'm sure he knew that. <laughs> Eagles Island is a coalition of a number of local, state, federal agencies, nonprofit, and for-profit organizations formed a couple of years ago. Um, talk just a little bit about Eagles Island. It does have quite a very past. There, um, that in the lower left corner, it was actually there was rice farming on the northern part of the island many moons ago. It, uh, there, there was a significant naval stores operation there. They made turpentine and pitch. Um, there was also shipbuilding on the island and significant shipping from the island. If you would, think of it as it was, in times past, a central industrial park. Well, Eagles Island Coalition has an idea for it being a different kind of central park, not so much an industrial park. There's also, as a result of its history and what's happened on the island, this is the shore of the island here, there's been 37 shipwrecks identified in the river along the island. These are part of the Wilmington uh, National Register of Historic Places. 
and it's also been very well documented by the underwater archaeology branch of the State Department of Cultural Resources, which is one of the members of the Eagles Island Coalition. There's also a rich natural history of the island, and both the natural history and the cultural history have been fairly extensively documented in this document that's, that you can find on the Eagles Island website. Uh, it's a history of the landscape, it's an inventory of the natural resources, the cultural resources on the island. It was contracted by the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, it was completed just this year. So take a look at that and you'll find out a lot more uh, about Eagles Island than I'm going to tell you tonight. I do want to talk a little bit about just some of the, the land ownership on the island. This is a map showing current land ownership. Um, and if you look at the northern part of the island, all these lands that are in blue, light blue and, and medium blue, are all in conservation at this time, either owned by the New Hampshire Soil and Water Conservation District, thank you Bill and Drew, um, or by the North Carolina State Division of Soil and Water, again both members of the coalition. We're currently working on conservation plans for those lands that's required for the for uh, those lands are required to have conservation plans as part of their articles of dedication. There's also some DOT land on the island. This is land that was bought by DOT as mitigation property for some of the wetlands they disturbed in creating the MLT Parkway and other area roadways. So they bought some mitigation property. So this again is in conservation. Um, battleship over here will be 49 acres, and then there's some additional the right away, DOT right away. So everything north of the 76 74 causeway, with the exception of this parcel over right here, and then some of these uh, riverfront properties south of the battleship are all uh, publicly owned properties at this time. If you go to the southern part of the island below the causeway, a little bit different here again. Uh, that's the state port zones, that property. Here's some more soil and water conservation district property. And then again, along the riverfront, there's privately owned properties. And then this big chunk, which is nearly half of the entire land mass, the, the island itself is 3,100 acres. This chunk here is about 1,400 acres owned by the Corps of Engineers. And it is currently, it has been for years, it's this land here. You can see it's divided up into cells. It's actively being used for soil for spoil disposal from their dredging operations so they actually are using these cells in um, series for spoil disposal this one here is a cell that has been closed for some time and revegetated so just an idea of the players and we were talking earlier it's just a, a real um, patchwork of landowners and just thinking of all those different uh, interests on the island it's, it's a very interesting Situation. I wanted to point out that there has been um, some thought given to the riverfront in the past, the Cape the Fear Corridor in the past. There was a plan that was done, I think it was back in 97, um, that was approved, adopted by Brunswick County, New Hampshire County, and the city of Wilmington as the Fear River Corridor Plan. And I just uh, captured a, a piece of it here um, in terms of the way it speaks to the other side, the west side of the Cape Fear um, waterfront, basically suggesting that it be um, reclaimed, that there be restoration, and that be a green area for, the, for our region. I also want to mention, Donna mentioned the Vision 2020 plan. I also brought a copy of the Vision 2020 plan. Um, and I just wanted, again, I'm just focusing on the other side of the island and what the Vision 2020 plan calls for. And it's suggesting enhancing a new green edge along the west side of the river to enhance pedestrian and bicycling activity. And if you see, if you look at the green area um, along the island, along the shore of the island, that's all it was anticipated by Vision 2020 as being natural area or open space. Also suggested that the underwater shipwreck historic site be incorporated into some cultural appreciation or cultural interpretation and made mention that a nautical um, a maritime museum could really focus on the past of the region. So what's the Eagles Island Coalition all about? And here 
we do have a mission statement. The mission is to lead efforts to conserve, manage the natural and cultural assets of Eagles Island and provide compatible educational and recreational opportunities. And that sounds like a lot. We've got some goals there in, in, in terms of how we see that being accomplished. But I'm going to stop right there and just say that Eagles Island Coalition has no money, owns nothing, it's not an entity, so it's all um, through partnerships and um, we are accepting donations and <laughs> have actually gotten a couple donations um, over the past couple years that we're um, putting to use. But basically, we see you know, through the lands that are in conservation trying to protect the species and the habitats that are existing there, it's one of the largest tidal marsh habitats in this region it exists on Eagles Island. Um, it's threatened by um, uh, sea level rise and saltwater intrusion and etc. But it is a significant habitat identified by the state. Also looking at the historical sites and the cultural artifacts and how do we um, make sure that they get protected and understood in the future. And then looking at opportunities for um, low impact recreation and ecotourism. One of the things that we've been doing, we've been focusing on towards those ends, if you look at this map and you can, uh, again, there's a, there's a jump off from our website that you can go to this map and see the, the planning that we've, um, that's gone into trying to identify um, kayak trails through the island and they've actually gone, we've got a committee that's looking at the, the water trails, the potential for water trails, and trying to connect those. Again, how can we get across the river? How can we connect with um, the town of Leland and Brunswick County's recreation facilities and their kayak launches? So there's been a lot of work put into that. Um, right now, we've, we do have a small grant from Kodak Foundation that we're using to um, put up, to come up with signage, both directional signage and some interpretive signage for these trails, um, and one of the next steps will be actually trying to get a camera permit to put that sign in place. And then one of the other things that we've done, and, and this is sort of the, again, remind you we have the money, but this is one of the um, big picture things, the long range of visions that we've had, that we've begun to have for the island. Um, we actually had, uh, Charette done, design shred done with Charles Boney and, and Donna Ray was part of that charrette. Um, it was pro bono work, or I guess since it was Charles Boney, pro bono work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> came, up with, came up with a concept for what the island could be and what it could house in terms of a another destination. And, and what we what we think is compatible is a low impact. Um, visitor center, a cultural um, and natural resource interpretive center, sort of a hub where it, it can be the, the stepping off point for uh, guided walks and for the kayak trails and also a, just an ancillary um, destination point to be compatible with what's going on in the battleship, just a compatible programming opportunity. So just uh, that's what I want to talk about, seeing that's sort of our vision for what might happen on the other side of the river, what we think could happen on the other side of the river, and after we're all done, we'd like to answer any questions. It's astounding, doing the economic history of this community, and to realize that on one side of the river was the residential, the retail, the trade, the professional, business service side of the community, and on the Eagle Island side is where the wealth was being created. So much of the value-added activity, Wilmington, of course, until the last century, was the largest city in North Carolina, it was the center of commerce, and much of that activity was played, taking place on the Line. And yet it has lain fallow for all these many these decades now. So to me, the most intriguing opportunity you may have in Wilmington is to take the bright minds and apply it to something like Eagle Island, which is just an incredible resource. Understanding, though, this is something I learned working on the Battleship Project. Now, I'm going to guess that only about maybe a quarter of y'all are from Wilmington. The rest of you are fairly recent residents of Wilmington. I mean, we're wrong. But certainly amongst folks who from this community, the idea of crossing the river 
is such a daunting prospect. I've not quite reconciled or understood this. But the idea of going over there, it's as though you still had to take a ferry boat over there. <laughs> or there was a pontoon bridge. This, but the, I, I think certainly, mentally, Eagle Island is over there, the battleship is over there, and it's not part of this community's consciousness. But it used to be a vital part of the economy here, and I'm finding some sustainable ways in which it can renew that role, I think is one of the great opportunities you have in this community. If you can get over this aversion to crossing water, you vampires or something, you won't cross the water. <laughs> but it's to be able to sit there on the waterfront, on Don Ray's waterfront, and see that beautiful land over there, uh, and all of its intriguing history, and all of its un untapped potential, and doing that in a careful way is one of the great opportunities for the creative minds who are from this community that have been attracted to this community. It's a fascinating opportunity. But I will warn you, We've done quite a bit of work with multi-jurisdictional economic development projects. It's terrible. I was looking at the GIS, the Geographic Information System, basically the property ownership of Eagle Island. Not only is it separated in all these different jurisdictions, you know, there's the, the, uh, the federal government, the parks, and you know, private owning. It's in two different counties. You've got this incredible opportunity, and perhaps the reason it has Lane Fallow is it's been divided in so many parcels. I, I like to spoil that. That basically means you're piling up sand there, isn't that right? We're building Mount Eagle over there. <laughs> but uh, to see something that was so vital in this community's economic and community life being uncapitalized upon, on the same time, that means it's available now for some creative new uses. That, that to me is an exciting prospect. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things that have happened in this community economically in the last 30, 40 years. Uh, and to have that opportunity lying right across the river is just so enticing. It's to be irresistible. But let's see what a resident and an investor thinks. Uh, my name is Reed Murkison, and uh, I think my only qualification for speaking tonight is that I happen to live near the river. <laughs> uh, my wife and, and two daughters and I have lived on Front Street for 28 years. I'm actually one of those native Wilmingtonians. How many native Wilmingtonians are actually here? Uh, overestimated. Uh, way less than four. Maybe maybe five percent of them. It seems to me pretty clear if you listen to people like Richard Florida and you just go to cities that are vibrant and doing well in this economy, that they are communities that attract talented, creative, energetic, entrepreneurial people. New York City is not really having a huge problem. It's as dense as it comes, but it attracts those kind of folks. They want to be there. They feed off of each other. Wellington downtown Wilmington along the riverfront needs to be the part of this community that provides that kind of dynamism, that kind of, uh, in a sense, cross-cultural uh, environment where, where people of all kinds of different uh, backgrounds, interests, come together and feed off each other. And I think from an economic point of view, to the degree that the riverfront and downtown can, can become that kind of place, it will aid the economic development of this whole region because it will attract not necessarily existing businesses here to build a plant, but those kind of folks who are probably one to three percent of the population who have whatever that magical combination of qualities it takes to create a gazelle business or nonprofit organization. Those kind of people want to be in that kind of community. Uh, and I think that we have, as a, as a region, we have a tremendous amount to offer, but we can do so much more. There is so much more potential. I've walked up and down the river probably five days a week for 28 years. And it has never, I've never stopped thinking, gosh, what 
what could this be? It's so much more than it was. Uh, when I moved back here from New York City in 1984, there were about two restaurants downtown that served dinner. And they both closed between 8 and 9 o'clock at night. That was it. Uh, you know what it is today. So you can see that there has been a huge uh, amount of movement in a very positive direction. The Riverwalk did not exist. Today, the Riverwalk is this amazing magnet for all kinds of people to spontaneously come together and be a community. And oftentimes, see somebody you know, you see thousands of people you don't know. But there is that kind of spontaneous coming together as a community. I was, I, I walked down there twice Saturday, once to go to the farmer's market to do some errands for my wife. And it was astounding. There was, it was almost wall to wall people. And I ran into three or four people I knew, and I would never have had those kind of chance conversations with them if, if that hadn't been there. But that creates community. And I ran into one, uh, one woman that I'd known in a professional capacity, and I said, oh, I didn't know you frequented the farmer's market. She said, I do every single Saturday. I love it. It's one of the things I love about this place. It's one of the reasons I moved here, to have this kind of thing to come to on a Saturday. It's not just the produce, and it's not just having the farmers, it's the people. And I think that there are opportunities other than that one stretch uh, where you have that, that kind of density of, of restaurants and coffee shops and tea rooms and, and, and boat tours and, and river market, river, uh, farmer's market. There are other, there ought to be more of that all up and down the river between the two bridges in my opinion. Uh, and I think that would, that will add to the quality of life, it will add to the dynamism of, of the downtown. Uh, in my view, just as a resident, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the whole mixed use concept. I think we need commercial, we need residential, we need tourism. We need recreation, we need culture, we need all of that in this, in this area. Uh, we, and I think as a community, we need at times to be willing to embrace something that may seem too big or too tall or too something. There has been, have been so many different efforts over the last 28 years to do one thing or another, that some major group has been, has organized to oppose. Uh, we not only have the problem of lots of different property owners, I mean, I don't know how many visions of the river we've had. You might remember, can you count them on one hand or does it take two or three or four? As somebody else who's been around government over these last 30 years, how many different plans for the river have we had? She could not remember. A dozen. You know, one gets done, it goes on the it goes on the shelf and then come around later and it's time to do another one and not a whole lot gets done. We've got to be willing to embrace some set of ideas and move forward and not simply I think as, as, as a community, that is important. Otherwise, we're just going to be stagnant. And stagnation is not what leads to any kind of economic development. The only other thing that I would say as, as a resident uh, is I'm a, I'm a big fan of what you're doing with the Eagles Island Coalition. There have been multiple plans to develop Eagles Island. I'm personally glad that that has laid fallow because it hasn't really been spoiled. It's not too late. And I think if there's some way to create that as, as, as this green space that connects us to Brunswick County through
kayak trails and whatnot, and some other way to connect it as a walking trail, biking trail, somehow creating a loop, very ecologically friendly loop with the riverfront, that that might somehow help connect the two and bring the two together. I'm not an architect, I'm not an expert, I just think. Um, but those are my thoughts, and I wish I had some real expertise to lend you, but that's about it. Well, read the comment through my <laughs> Occasionally when we work with the community on economic development, we're forced into the role of community therapist. <laughs> I hesitate to assert that role in as well. But I, one of my former colleagues, Bill Williams, in the room, and I told him something earlier, and I'll tell you, is that usually when we're working in a community on some sort of economic development project, we're working with a central organization. They're often called a committee of 100. But in Wilmington, you don't have a committee of one. We have one. But you also have 100 committees of one. <laughs> And I very often heard in our conversations, I mean, let's put it, we were studying the battleship, but that sort of became our excuse to talk to everybody interesting that we wanted to talk to, which is why we talked to so many of you. And I heard over and over again what I think is a fallacy, and the fallacy is, is that we need a consensus. We need a consensus in this community. Well, you might as well just forget that. You're not going to get a consensus. You don't need a consensus for action. You need enough of us for action. And I don't know what's going to galvanize, galvanize enough of you. It seems to be pretty easy to galvanize people against stuff in this community. Maybe you have a luxury that many of other Eastern North Carolina towns don't have, which is to be fractious. Uh, but you have so many assets here. But the idea that you've got to get a consensus, or the fact that there's more than one economic development group is some sort of malady, that's, that's not true. You have different visions in this community, and you're going to have a lot of different uh, central uh, agencies for action. Um, and that's fine. That's healthy in a community as diverse and as, and as disparate as this one is. So forget, forget worrying about consensus building. You, you need support. You need people committed to action to make things happen. Now, let me get Steve's opinion on it. I, think, I don't know Steve. Steve introduces him first. At, I'm an attorney. <laughs> no, somebody else introduced me. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I told him I was glad to have an attorney in the room. He was sort of shocked when I said that. But I am glad to have you here. Thank you, Ron. I love the opening statement that was made by Tom when he was explaining the small child uh, that looked out on the water. And the first thing he said was the big water. I think it's good for me to do a book in, take the other extreme, where I had maybe six months ago of escorting to the ocean front a 90-year-old woman who had never seen the ocean. She was coming to my house, and I was not going to miss that chance and to see what that reaction would be. And I took her out there, and she looked out. It was a long silence, and of course it was a gorgeous day, and the sea was up, and it was foaming large. And she turned to me and she said, what do you do about the noise? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a lot of noise, so. <laughs> and that noise is that creative cauldron that we've been talking about here tonight. Creativity is stifled in a lot of ways by the existing physical environmental and man-built infrastructure that we're talking about. Uh, the environmental structure, as you said, somebody doesn't want to cross the river, go over the Ukulai. Uh, the reason why they don't want to cross the river is because of our infrastructure that you have to go around your elbow four or five times to get to Ukulai. We also have a legal infrastructure. And the current legal infrastructure doesn't make things any easier. Throw up the map again of e I wish you, I wish you would do that for me, real quick. Holy moly. <laughs> Look at all those jurisdictions with authority, and that's just on the Eagle Island side. Right? Thank you. 
Let me segue over that to an earlier comment that you made, okay, about intergovernmental cooperative agreements and whatnot. It was terrible, he said. Okay? I, I will concede to you that it is a long, hard road. But I will tell you also that marriage is tough. It is a long, hard road. But if it, you dedicate yourself to it and you don't be uh, held up by the naysayers, there is nothing in this life more rewarding than a marriage that you will work hard at and to see it through to something that is worthwhile. <coughs> I suggest to you that you need for your lawyer to be just as creative as your entrepreneurs and creative divisions for those who want to make our environment. After all, the only thing that brings wealth and environmental beauty is creativity. And you need for your laws to do that for you as well. I'm now old enough to see the tragedy of well-intentioned people wanting to create that will, wanting to create that beauty by using legal approaches that are not much older than the Magna Carta. Yes, we've got these disparate groups, the disparate governments, the disparate geographies and whatnot, but isn't it finally an opportunity now as opposed to a problem? We go back to the opening statement. There is no capital anymore. There is no money. I'm keeping it real here. There is no money. Government doesn't have it. Traditional investment houses don't have it anymore. There is no one to do this but us. Who is us? It is every business here. It is every government here. Like it or not, we are married. Are we going to have a good marriage or are we going to have a bad marriage? You need a legal infrastructure in place to help that marriage take place. So I want to suggest something here for the purposes of discussion tonight. Okay? It's like, um, it's not like I'm taking a stand. Just think of me as the referee beginning the basketball game that throws the ball. Okay? There is a synergy that need, that's needed for any one of these proposed projects to have any chance at all of succeeding in this horrible environment we have of no money. The battleship will sink financially if it tries to stand on its own. Eagle Island will stay fallow and maybe even deteriorate environmentally if it tries to stand just on its own. The Riverwalk Park, okay, even after 15, 20 years of work, will get stuck again if it tries to stand on its own. Those who want to have some other source of entertainment here close to downtown will sink if they try to stand on its, on its own. You cannot ignore the fact that all of these elements here need each other. There's a synergy here that exists that makes this community great and it's great talent. So what are the legal issues involved in that? Well, they exist in our statutes through things called authorities. And, for instance, when I was in Raleigh for 25 years, I saw two extremes of things that happened. Uh, you really should have seen it when the time came when Jim Goodman wanted to, uh, he bought and owned the Durham Bulls, and the Durham Bulls were playing in the old uh, Durham baseball field where there's a high school where I, for Wilson, I would actually go play Durham High School in that old park. And he had this vision to upgrade. And as you know, he is the, uh, the primary owner and the chief executive of uh, Capital Broadcasting System. He was perfectly willing to want to move that stadium over to uh, the Raleigh. Move the Durham Bulls to Raleigh. Oh, you should have seen how proud the Durham Bulls had in that. Okay? And they made a deal for uh, Jim Goodman could not refuse. And because of that marriage, it's, it was hard work. Because you think Wilmington is fractious? Read the daily paper in Durham and count your blessings. Okay? 
But a marriage was made, and it's been a good marriage. What has happened out of that effort with uh, Jim Goodman and Durham Bulls is something to behold. Fast forward then another 10 years, when a guy named Jim Balvano suggested there ought to be a really great place for the Wolfpack to play. Okay, this was after the Dean Dome was all, had already been built. And Jim Balvano, that guy, was a visionary, and he went to the, the city councils and the county commissioners and all the way around uh, and says, we really need something to compete. And when people says, no, it's got to be downtown Raleigh. Other uh, people says, no, it needs to be a research triangle park or something. They had a marriage, unbelievable, of the state of North Carolina, Durham County, the Triangle Transit Authority, Wake County, the city of Wil uh, Rock, the city of Cary, uh, various other things. Uh, the Wolfpack Club, the, the Consolidated University of North Carolina, and a private enterprise that owned a team that plays hockey. Boy, at first I thought that was a marriage made in hell. <laughs> okay, and it was. They were talking about that at the end of. You may recall there was a recession in the early nineties. Well. They stuck with that marriage and they plugged away and they plugged away and they plugged away. And lo and behold, what do you see out there? What used to be that big cow pasture, in fact, outside of Carter Finney Stadium. They have succeeded in being an anchor for development and business and entertainment, not only for the Research Triangle Park, but they've also improved the transportation links between that particular facility and downtown Raleigh. And lo and behold, they have a new convention center in downtown Raleigh. They have moved that old convention center out to the middle of uh, the Fable, was, you know, Fable Street Mall and opened up the most beautiful vista that you've, that you've ever seen. You wouldn't see, uh, except perhaps in Paris or Buenos Aires or something like that. But you can directly tie it to the economic benefit that came when they, what they did came as the Centennial Center because people worked in a marriage because they had assets. And those assets were those different entities that you talked about and private enterprise. Let me suggest to you that if you're going to get the political will for it, if you don't have any money, what you need to look at then is a financing structure and probably we need to get read and perhaps we talk about this. And that's something that gives the illusion Keep real of free money. And the illusion of free money is the revenue bonds. The revenue bonds being that the total security for bond, everything, the money has to be paid back, okay, to build all these wondrous things. Whether it is a theater on the oil, or to renovate, upgrade, battleship, and all the facilities around the park, or to pay for the walkway on, on the riverfront or another facility that's um, on the, the, the Wilmington side, okay? It's secured totally by the revenues from whatever it is, or perhaps room occupancy tax, or a food and beverage tax, okay? Not property taxes, that kind of thing. Now, why is that a good thing? Because if it's got to be paid for out of the revenues of the project, don't all the actors then have real skin in the game so they don't default. Um, we may fuss and we may fight, but once we're married, okay, we know the failure's not the option, we know the mortgage's got to be paid, and we know if it has to be paid for revenues, okay, all of a sudden I'm willing to bet you'll see some creativity in people working together. And yes, it can happen. And if you don't see the legal instruments are here, you do the same thing you did in Winston-Salem, the same thing you did in Raleigh. Uh, they went and they got a local bill passed through the General Assembly that enabled them and empowered them to do the things that they did. There's all sorts of ways to get the legal infrastructure that you need. It also requires thinking outside the box. But everything is, po is possible. If you go, in these times, if you go to Raleigh, if you're not asking for money, it's amazing what they'll do for you. <laughs> Thank you. Good, very good. Well, I don't know what y'all came here expecting to hear, but I always expect to hear something surprising. What we were reminded of today is that the riverfront's got two sides to it. 
The Honorator reminding us about the hard work that's been put in on the, on the river, on the city riverside. And Phil's talking about the opportunities on the, what do you call, what do you call the other side, the Eagle Island side, but I didn't know if there was West Coast, the West, the West, the West Bay. <laughs> the West Bay. Oh, 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 that's a little too appropriate, I'm afraid. <laughs> and what, what I would see in this community is what is typically and easily viewed as a, as a negative is, is a fractious nature, or a divided nature in this community. But the reality is, as, as Steve was just pointing out, you've got to turn that into an asset. And that's going to take some creative approaches to build it. Now, the kind of marriage you described, when we get to that, Matt suggested more of a polygamous marriage than a traditional marriage. But <laughs> well, that's got to become this community's strength, is the ability to take different opinions and meld them together. There's no more American concept than that. Uh, so, so when people are seeking consensus, and I think fut futilely so, we need to be looking for how we can weave together the different opinions in this community. And you know that, that picture right there is a pretty good illustration of metaphor for the challenge you have in the community. And of course, you all know if we expand that a little bit more, we'd see all the other areas of Wilmington that uh, represent a challenge in terms of meshing them together. But I've appreciated that the, the Cape Fear EDC has been a spontaneously, organically formed group. It's not an instrument of government that's being uh, top down. It's very much a, a grassroots effort to bring together some dif different opinions that have traditionally been heard in the community. Uh, so I applaud that. And if there have been many efforts at re envisioning uh, the Cape Fear River for this community, then the question is, is not necessarily a lack of vision. It's, it's an understanding of how the process can be more successful going forward. This is really a process challenge more than a product challenge. I think a community that can capitalize on the process can overcome some of the realities we face in the current economy in terms of limited capital. Um, you always hear people say how hard it is to herd cats. I've never, I got cats. It's easy. You don't herd, first of all, you can't herd cats. You lead cats with what? Food. Now, what is the food that's going to lead cats? here in this community, because it's no longer going to be external money. It used to be easy to, to lead cats if you could bring external money to the table. This, the cats here in one are going to have to find a reason to work together. And uh, I think taking on a challenge like the, uh, the, the revitalizing the role of Cape Fear in this community is an interesting opportunity to do that. Wait, Tom, are we going to open up for questions now? Yes, sir. All right. You got one to start us off with, Tom? No, I'm afraid. Well, I'm, since I don't know anybody here, I'll just point. Yes, sir. Stand up and introduce yourself. I always like to know who you are. I'm David Stallman. I'm eight years a transplant here in the north. And uh, one of the common complaints that I hear from business here is the costliness of the transportation to get out on the limb out here to Wilmington because we're off the mainstream paths. Uh, you know, whether the grocery business or, or whatever, uh, the uh, Peter Joe is finally coming through here. But anyway, uh, uh, in my researching of the history of, of uh, the cotton exchange in uh, the downtown area, I've been finding that the railroads were very connected with the river. So I think that we can't not talk about the railroads and the possibility of rail transportation. As a future investment, it once was an economic factor. When the railroad left, the top town of town of Toots for a while. And uh, it's, that was very pronounced. It just seems like rail could be coming back. It might, might seem like looking at yesterday, but uh, uh, it looks to me like a good possibility. Oh, come on, if you're enthusiastic, show it. Yay, bro! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to testify? Yes, sir. Uh, Clark Gibb, uh, local uh, resident. And I'm not sure if this is for Eve or for Steve, but what, what would investors, uh, looking at uh, an opportunity like this, what would they expect from local and state government as far as encouragement or we hear a lot about incentives to bring tire factory or uh, something of that nature. What, uh, we, have, we have incentives for the movies, for the studios. 
what kind of incentives or, or activities would investors look for from the state or local government? The second question is a little different than the first. I think the first, the first thing that the investors want from the local community and um, I, I can answer that, you can too. They want certainty. They want predictability. Period. If you can't give it to them, they won't come. Yeah, I, I think Steve's right. I think that's on a, even a national scale, one of the reasons our recovery is no greater than it is. There is so much that is unclear. We have, I mean, just at the national level, a slew of major tax laws that are going to either completely change in on January 1 of 2013, or will be modified in some way. No one has a clue what's going to happen, and so no one is going to step out on a limb in this kind of environment and make big bets. I think at the local level, if I think about the developers, the architects that I've talked to over the years, and these are all community-minded people. These are not quick buck Charlie folks. They find the process to be so onerous and in some cases so unpredictable that they're always on the verge of throwing up their hands and saying, I'm going to do something else. I'm, I'm not in that business. I don't, I've never developed anything. But just anecdotally listening to, to folks who <clears throat> care about the quality of what they do and the quality of this community, who are in those fields, who have expressed frustration that is so deep. I think that's a I think that's a big issue. To use a concrete example, which strong about for instance, for revenue bonds. The revenue bonding uh, companies, the investment uh, garments or whatever we want to finance it, believe me, they will take a hyper examination for this community, every single level of it. And if they pick up a whiff of fractiousness or whatnot, and they think that we're doing the project, it's not going to happen. So if you decide to go the revenue bond route, let's just say uh, you need this polygamous marriage needs to have worked hard together for a long time to come up with a plan to make that kind of thing happen. But it seems to me that if you do come up with a financial instrument that we're not asking anybody to raise the property taxes or the income taxes, or sale taxes or whatnot, to me, that's a marriage that's worth working hard on. I, I think if you look at something like Eagle Island, I don't know that that's an investor question. Uh, I think of uh, I think of that as very complicated. But how many people were here when the Society to Preserve Masonboro Island was founded and got off the ground? They had a lot more landowners owning parcels on Masonboro Island, the title to which many of were, were very difficult to pin down, but there was a group that focused on it and stayed at it, and eventually, is it, what percentage of Masonboro Island is now It's close. It's not 100%, but it's really close. And I think Eagle Island is a sim I mean, that strikes me as a similar kind of situation. You need a group in the vanguard to get it going, and then eventually you get some critical mass with you. You raise a lot of private dollars and you negotiate. And I see that. I think that's locally about as good an analogy as I can think of. Phil, you work with the Eagle Island Coalition. What has that taught you about, as you pointed out, you don't have any money, you don't have any authority. Well, what has that work taught you about getting different jurisdictions and different interests uh, to begin talking together and working together for some common purpose, for defining a common purpose? I think that part of it's been easy. We've got, um, 18, like I said, 18 or 20 members of the coalition. It includes um, several of the local governments that are on the island. And, 
you know, we know that Brunswick County, Parliament's in Brunswick County, Parliament's in New Hanover County. Um, probably not everybody realizes that Leland has annexed part of Eagles Island. I don't think Wilmington's going to be annexing any anytime soon, but they actually, the, there's a couple of pieces of this property that Leland has annexed. So it's, it's, there's a lot of players there, um, but I think the, the vision is shared. I think we've got um, a lot of good ideas and I think a lot of momentum. Um, you've worked with the battleship, and so you know Captain Bragg, who is, um, uh, he's, he's one of our members. So the, the battleship is one of the members of the coalition. And he is quite an ambassador. I don't think he goes anywhere without talking about the potential for Eagles Island. So I, I don't think getting the people talking is the problem. I think um, the fact that there is still some questionable properties or properties that the, there isn't the certainty that you're talking about. Um, now, the Corps of Engineers property, for example, it's a huge piece of property that we have no idea what's going to happen with it when they decide they're done filling it. We have no idea. We do know that they've recently uh, increased the, their, they're working on increasing their levies, so it's going to be there a while longer. But that we don't know about. The DOT property, we've had, we brought them into the form of discussions with them to talk about what the, what could be done on their property. Can we have access to their property, for example? What is what are their future plans? So, getting the people talking about the problem is figuring out the all the there's a lot of absentee landowners on Eagles Island. There's, you know, you know, there's, there's New York landowners on Eagles Island. There's businesses on, on Eagles Island that we don't know what's going to happen when they close shop. So. Those are, those are the real questions, I think, is trying to figure out how we get ahead of some of these things and have an opportunity when some of these landowners do want to give up their land. Uh, let me call on this young lady right here. Uh, I'm Susan Banton. I'm a local resident, but I've been involved with entrepreneurial work uh, before, and I just wondered if the city or the area has any kind of strategic plan for attracting those entrepreneurs that you're talking about that one to three percent. I mean, on the one hand, the downtown strikes me as being incredibly entrepreneurial because every, you know, every restaurant, every uh, store owner in the downtown is, is an entrepreneur by definition. But, uh, but I think what you're also talking about is attracting those that one to three percent. And I just wondered if there's any uh, strategic planning in place to attract that kind of uh, activity to the area. Or would you like to respond to that? <laughs> Um, the city does several things. A strategic plan, I wouldn't say we really have. But we do support organizations that do have plans to support entrepreneurship. And we have put money in the budget to support the movement of the entrepreneurship that was at UNCW to being a separate facility. Uh, and that, that facility should bring some of this together as well. But your, your question is, is well taken because we really don't have a strategic plan that encompasses the city or concentrates on downtown other than supporting the Wilmington Downtown Inc. organization and supporting the um, Wilmington Industrial Development Business Development. And we support the film industry and a lot of other things like that. Um, the Arts Council. I mean, I can go on and on with various and sundry areas that we support. Um, I will tell you that we're very close, and a lot of you will be interested in this from a development perspective as well as a planning perspective. We are very close to hiring a new planning director. Um, there's been a good deal of effort going into that. We hired a consultant to look at our processes, how do we make them uh, work better, how do we make them smoother, how do we make them more predictable, um, and I hear that a lot too. So that should bring both businesses and entrepreneurs and developers who want to do the right thing. Okay, uh, uh, Cape Fear Futures does yeah, it. Yeah, they focus <laughs> heavily on, I mean, that, that's their kind of, their thing is to focus on the, of attracting those type of folks, uh, the, the, this creative class. Or whatever. This is Neil Anderson with the city council. Whatever Richard Flores term and all those terms he uses, that's they've been their focus. And to pile on what Laura was talking about with the, um, the entrepreneurial center is really it's a, it's an exciting thing, and I'm, I haven't found out whether the county's going to help us with this with it. I hope they will. But it, getting them getting it out of uh, it's, they're they're kind of 
harnessed by the, by being a part of the, um, of the university and all the rigmarole we have to go through with the university system. They wanted to get out and go be independent. And and ultimately, within just a couple of years, their game, their their business plan is to be up self self sufficient. Where they don't need any more money. They the, the rent from the people that are stage two and stage three in their in their programs uh, will pay for the, for the facility. Versus this, so the city's just looking at it as a startup. And uh, if it sounds like a good idea to you, hope you'll uh, push the county to do the same. So I think it be a great little incubator for folks uh, here in here in the city. Good. Oh, yeah. That's something far back. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I just want to say a couple things. One, in, in luring the creative class knowledge workers that we've determined that we need, we really need to consider the built environment. And it goes back to the idea of how we're building. And Wilmington's been behind, you know, in uh, zoning codes and mixed use and all of that um, as far as builders go for a very long time it's super obvious if you move from another area and you come here and if you're trying to lure younger youthful creative you know super entrepreneurial types they want to live in neighborhoods where they can walk they want to live you know that's all part of it so zoning also does correlate to housing property values it's been proven over and over again so that needs to be something that really is started to embrace be embraced more Green building is not a, a fad and a false a falsehood that we don't have that here. People who are coming from other areas who have that knowledge worker creative class mindset, they, the housing stock doesn't even exist for those type of people to, you know, for the most part, it's just not available. Um, the other thing I just want to mention was that um, a lot has been mentioned about creating a technology sector. Oh, we got to create a technology sector. That's what Silicon Valley did. That's what Charleston's doing. That's what RTP did. But what is hot right now is sustainability in every way, shape, and form. And that is from a whole systems approach. That includes technology. That includes the environment. It, it, it's the combination of all of it. And with our Mar, Mar Bionic Center and Entrepreneurship Center and all of the different things going on with um, the environmental groups and the businesses, there's an incredible opportunity to focus Focus on luring this growing sector, which Harvard Business Review says, you know, is the emerging megatrend to sustainability. So, you know, in your mind, where, what regions have, you know, where do you go for the sustainability sector? There's not really one. North Charleston's done a good job of developing itself as that, but, you know, we have this opportunity to seize that. And, and that's where, you know, 74 percent of college graduates come out and want to work for a cause they believe in. Um, they'll, they'll go live where they you know can work for that cause and that's something that I think we're not doing too is kind of honing in on what is the next thing and how can we maximize our benefits here to attract these growing sectors but we have to look at the built environment rezoning rethinking about how we live and how our neighborhoods function <coughs> as well so that's, that's my comment <laughs> All right, I got, I got to get you. I got to get you. First of all, Tom, CFETC, thank you very much for putting together the great program. This is about my third time I've attended an event here. I'm always surprised with the caliber of people. So thank you all for being here. If I understand what you're talking about correctly, that the premise of the fractured economic model is the premise of the discussions. Um, fractured economic model meaning how can there's no outside investment you've heard of we know that from the mortgage market we know that from the commercial market we know that from the investor market so if I understood correctly the theme the theme is we have to do this together and to your point whether or not the marriage is going to work or not we all have to work together we all have to share in that marriage we all have to work together for in this case downtown the question I have is the following. In a really capitalistic environment, there's always the risk-reward factor. But no longer is there that kind of a model. Because the money, while it's there, is not being invested. So is the economic development model for a city then predicated upon the city, the taxpayers, the voters of the city, being a contributor, i.e. to what you were talking about before, um, to that to the active participation 
and helping ourselves. I would suggest to you, if that's the new model, then there needs to be greater rewards back to the taxpayers for their investment. And that would come in the form of not only economic development and jobs, but straight off the top, profitability from the entities that the taxpayers have invested in. Thank you. Okay. You need to stop that. <laughs> that they take a river tour. Because to me, that's the best way to see this city. And it's also one of the least likely ways you're going to see this city. So I think, to me, that's why capitalizing on the value of the river, the riverfront from both sides, is one of the great opportunities you have here. It's a beautiful place. And even if you have to go all the way over to the other side of the river to see it, that can be reason enough for many of the visitors. I've, I've spent a good bit of time on the river paddling. Uh, in, in the Eagle Island area, Alligator, um, Alligator Creek. Um, one of the problems with navigating from Wilmington across to Eagles Island is the river itself. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult river. And, and self-propelled craft, be it a kayak or a canoe, it's, it's a fast-moving river. Uh, it's very, it's broad. The wind uh, tends to play havoc on any any, any launch that you would put from, from this side of the river. It's a good workout. It is a good workout, <laughs> but the reward is great. Right. Some, some of the irrigation canals, the, the, the old rice, place, rice plantation irrigation canals are just fabulous. Um, the goal, I think, would be uh, 20 years ago, I worked uh, to try to develop the idea of the Cape Fear River Trail that ran from Fayetteville, Clark Park, no relation, down, down to, uh, all the way down to, um, to Oak Island. And we uh, designated certain put-in, take-out points along the river to do that. Um, nothing much came from that because the fractious uh, separation of the different municipalities and counties along the way, but um, back to Eagle Island, that, that concept of having a river trail or a river system would work on Eagle Island if there was a place on Eagle Island somewhere, uh, somewhere near the uh, battleship or maybe near the shooting range uh, that the Sheriff's Department has. 
where people can come and put their boats in in that area and not have to cross the river but be in that system and that would be that could be a potential starting point to to enjoy that system from the river uh, i think the pamico sound has a wonderful uh, paddle trail and, and and all the municipalities and counties around the pamico sound have developed a, a, a system of trails they have they have canoe launches or canoe uh, camping grounds that are not connected to any uh, street thoroughfare or anything they're just raised platforms where you where you would paddle two or three hours to get to them and then you would camp on these raised uh, these raised platforms so there's an opportunity to use that area from a paddle standpoint but I think it has to be from Eagle Island it's very hard to go from from here across to Eagle Island. And if I can just add to that, that's one, that's one of the reasons that, if you saw that map that I had up there showing the paddle trails through Eagles Island, most of the emphasis was on accessing from the Brunswick side and from the, you know, the, the land on Brunswick because it's a whole lot easier to access across the Brunswick River than it is across the Cape River. And we've really struggled with that. And we, you know, when we looked at the New Hampshire uh, Wilmington Greenway plan, trying to figure out if there's a way to um, connect what uh, they're focusing on in on the on this side of the river is there a way to connect it's a difficult connection it's a difficult thing i mean it's, it's a big liability if you say okay here's a here's a water trail going across the cape fair river and you have to pull people out <laughs> down, down the ball head or something so i have i have two comments about the embracing our nautical heritage and one is what phil showed was um, the vision 2020 plan has the idea for a maritime museum which is an extremely good idea considering that we need another downtown attraction to take families and you know that would be an ideal one um, the other idea is that if you've been to San Diego they have um, uh, tall ships that are permanently moored there that act as museums you pay admission to tour them kind of like the bounty that's down there now and you know what a what a beautiful attraction for the waterfront that embraces our nautical heritage Tom Conway, our host, has asked okay. This is a question for Phil and maybe for you too, Brett. Um, an intelligent, very intelligent person locally said to me, recreation, broadly speaking, is Wilmington's biggest industry. So if you accept that premise, is it possible from the Brunswick side right now to have a tour of the battleship and then for a family to rent a kayak for two or four hours and, and, and is there access possible for that so that this would be a destination uh, across the river I'll, I'll start out to say there's, a, there's very little without, again, without putting out into the river there's very little um, high ground on Eagles Island that you can easily access um, that's to be seen if there's a good location from the island and not certainly not right there by the battleship because there's nowhere to put up on put out at the battleship without having to go out to the river to get anywhere else so it's a it's a challenge well, what about go inland say the battleship is here what about going from the battleship and working way inland to these uh various kind of things you got to get across 421 yeah yeah it is a block Wet, wetlands and DOT are big hurdles. You can access through, Day, I think it's called Davis uh, Creek, which is off the Brunswick River. Uh, there's a park. I think it's called Davis Creek Park. Uh, but it's way, it's, it's, you have to go through Navassa, and it, it's, it's very difficult to find. But once you get to that park, you can launch there, come down Davis Creek to get to Brunswick River. And then from the Brunswick River, you can get into Alligator Creek. And which 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 is the horizontal line just above uh, 17 there. That that's the connection from the Brunswick River over to Alligator. Alligator Creek is the S that runs through the middle of the Eagle Island. Uh, but that's a that's from Davis Creek into Alligator Creek's an hour paddle at least. And 
an hour and forty an hour and thirty minutes to have had other things. Can I just say one quick thing? We, and nobody's mentioned the sustainability. You will, you can if you introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Johnny. I'm Johnny Sharp, and I have the Buena Space a couple blocks down, which is a co working space for technology, green entrepreneurs, whoever, free nonprofits. And I have a startup business two and a half years in Wilmington called Buena Sustainable Communities, and I'm working on sustainable visioning and sustainable business. But um, the Sustainable Consortium Grant. Pender, we can over Brunswick County, $1.13 million planning grant. I just feel like we need to say something about it in this forum and maybe feel you can speak to it. I would feel easier to have a dialogue with you if you could be a little bit more precise with what you mean about sustainability. sustainability. I can't get my arms around the way you present it. You can get a little bit more specific. <laughs> sustainability is the ability to thrive today without sacrificing the future generation's ability to thrive. But also it's looking thrive. at things. Thrive. 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 Survive and thrive. Economic, but it includes people, planet, and profit. So if we don't have people, we don't have planet, we don't have any profit. And it's basically a whole systems approach to thinking about business, economic development, and um, everything. So sustainability is now becoming just a basic way of doing business. You know, uh, people are realizing big companies from Dow Chemical. Coca-Cola. You know, this is a huge industry that's growing fast and it incorporates every type of business and incorporates city building, the convergence of buildings, IT, infrastructure, design. You know, it, um, so it's, it's a large, it's a large swap, but it's basically the way we're having to look at what we're talking about. Is that this is what we've got? We're all right here. This is our community, and how are we going to work together to solve these problems because every other community is fighting the same battles. And whatever we come up with here is then going to be an opportunity for us to then sell it to some other community that hasn't been So, um, but, but basically, I, I was just thinking that the, we've got a $1.13 million consortium grant that the Pender from New Hanover County got, which includes economic development and, and coming together. So I thought, Phil, maybe you could update us on what's going on with that and how that might tie into the things that we're talking about here. Well, it, and I'm glad you mentioned that. It is um, a significant grant. We're just in the early phases of trying to figure out governance and trying to figure out uh, the work plan. Um, but it is the, the three county region it includes a consortium that includes a number of um, housing nonprofits, transportation sector um, partners, government partners, um, so it's basically focusing on trying to tie together um, housing, transportation options, economic development, and environmental sustainability. It's um, a three-year grant. Ask me more about it. I think actually there was somebody who talked to this group the last uh, last month or the month before about that grant and you know, how we're just getting started. In a year, ask us again, and we'll give you a lot more information on it. But thanks for asking. I had a question down in here. Was it you, Carolyn? I do. My name's Caroline. I am a resident. Um, I'd like to digress just back to connectivity across the West Bank, as you call it, to our side. It seems like it would be possible to do something with kayaks and maybe have brands or some type of fun that are great. Someone that would be great. We have no pedestrian way to go back and forth. You know, like when you go to Charleston, when they build a Bridge. There is a pedestrian lane on that bridge, um, as well as for bikers and whatnot. And we just don't have that here. Our the infrastructure for the city isolates itself from your idea. And you know, not everyone's going to get in that kayak. You're right. Chris. I mean, it's, it's a it is part of I think uh, the vision, the vision of 2020 plan is to actually have some pedestrian. Now this is long in the future. I mean, I can't imagine walking across Memorial Bridge right now. <laughs> People do, I guess, but I'm not going to do it. But you're, you're right, there is a big issue there. I think if, if it does become more of a destination, it will you know, open up other avenues for getting over there. I think water taxis is an option, uh, a more readily available option. Um, but I think you know, it's a challenge. I was struck when I saw the projected cost of adding pedestrian bicycle lanes to bridges. And, 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 
may actually know some of the figures that are out there and all this stuff. I'm really taking a back by it. I'm curious, based on the bringing up the Charleston example, those bridges, maybe those aren't good examples, because you know those bridges you know, are, are, are huge. I'm not sure I would uh, want to walk on that walkway that's there. Because uh, it's, 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 it's very popular. <laughs> I was but, wondering how often it's used. Oh, that's it. It's the only one that's trying to use a lot. Bridge. It's heavily used. I just want to reemphasize the, the bicycle part of that. Um, I'm, I'm all for pedestrian uh, ways for sure, but the distance we're talking about seems natural for a cyclist rather than, a, I mean, that, that's an all day hike. I meant to include. Um, I, just, I just want to reemphasize that piece because it, it seems to often be forgotten in the community. Okay, let's say uh, this gentleman right here in front of the pole. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm John Hunt's Tyke, and I'm, I'm going to take you in a different direction. Um, I've been involved in the arts in Wilmington for the last two long. But I'm on the board of a group called ARCH, the Alliance for Regional Concert Hall. And I am very much in favor of a baseball stadium downtown on the river. I'm also very much in favor of seeing a performance hall down on the river. If we had the synergy of those two things down on the waterfront, you'd bring so many people downtown in Wilmington that you would be absolutely amazed at the business and the economic development it would bring. And that's what we're here talking about tonight. We have brought consultants in for the last 15 years. We have brought them to talk to city council. They have talked to the county commissioners. We have brought people from Nederlander Entertainment in New York. They are very interested in Wilmington. They would like to bring uh, the Lion King and these sorts of things to Wilmington. But they have to have a theater that will seat 24, 2,500 people. That's the only way it makes economic sense. And a theater like that can operate 365 days a year. Baseball field can only operate about six months. So that is a really much bigger economic driver than a baseball field is. So this is a group that ought to really seriously be thinking about that sort of thing. We have tried and tried. Ruth Funk is really the leader of this thing. She's not able to be here tonight. But uh, this, this is one of the best things that could happen to this community. I have people tell me all the time that they don't have any reason to bring their children downtown after the sun goes down. We had a baseball field and a performance hall downtown in Wilmington. There'd be a reason to bring your children downtown after dark. So I think the Economic Development Council needs to get behind both of these efforts. And I think we need to tell our city people to quit worrying about a penny or two of tax and, and be more like Charleston and give people what they need instead of being concerned all the time because of taxes. The city has been so burned because of the convention center that they are scared to death to do anything. And if we do that, we're going to stay right where we are right now. We're never going to progress. We're never going to get anywhere near what Charleston is. We've got to think way outside the box. And uh, there are a lot of people in here a lot younger than I am. And they would be able to enjoy these things a lot longer than I can. But please, people, think about these things and, and rattle the cage of the people that run the city. Because these things are possibilities. There are ways to get money to do these things. There are people in Wellington getting money to build a hotel down here. And they're getting money from China. I mean, you've got to think outside the box and you've got to do things creatively. And as, as um, he's saying, you've got to work together and make these things happen. So make yourselves heard. Make a lot of noise. I want to propose that we wind things up. I don't know, Brent, if you want to, if you want to, you know, uh, sort of.
conclude things, but I want to give everyone a chance to take off if they need to take off, if the hard folks want to stick around and continue talking and here, it would be great, but I think we could sort of uh, conclude things. We have a call to adjourn. We'll hear a second. <laughs> Although, adjourn is one of the more second. Uh, Tom? Did you step out? He just stepped out. Well, yes. Before we, before we conclude, one thing about the recreational side, you know, there's a developer downtown right now building a marina, and he's betting on, he's betting on what's happening. What what, some, some things play in your hand, such as the federal government's no longer dredging the intercoastal waterway like they have in the past, and there's a, a, a pretty a, a thought that the river, since it is dredged for commerce, may become a playground for the bigger boats and the halfback from Florida and so forth. And uh, th that marina down there could could be that draw. Uh, and that's a, a, a the type that's a certain clientele that spends a lot of money in, in, uh, in our downtown. So it's, it's exciting. So you never know some things that you are mad and complaining about might turn out well for a uh, Right some beaches where you see them all now. One day you might see them all right downtown. Well, thank you all for being here today. Thanks to the panelists for being here.